How many were here for Sabbath school class? Amen. How many were blessed by what you heard? How many of you have never heard this before? You've all heard it before? I haven't heard it before. So we're going to do a little quiz and something's wrong with the sound, so. What was the first part that God does for us in the plan of redemption. He draws us. And what is our, what is our part, our first part in that plan? Amen. As we start, I'm going to have prayer, but before I do, I want to give you some background on this on this, it's not new theology, it's been around the whole time. It's just that we never have studied deep enough to understand what this is all about. One of our speakers came to worship with us several months ago, and um, he spoke and he said, Roy, you're in charge today, so I have a gift for you. And he gave me this book. I took the book and I looked at the first page and I said, it's just a compilation of LNG White quotes. I don't want to read that right now. So I put it away. And two weeks later, I picked it back up and started reading. The Holy Spirit said, read the book. What did we learn today in Sabbath school class? Do not resist the Holy Spirit. He told me to read the book, so I read the book. But before I actually started reading the book, I googled the author's name, and I went online and found her sermons. And I listened to her sermons. And that caused me to go back and read the book. So before we start, we're going to have prayer. So let's kneel as far as possible and ask for the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, as we come to you on this wonderful Sabbath day, we thank you and praise you that have given, you've given us one more day to live for you. We pray, dear Lord, that as I get ready to speak, that you would hide me behind the cleft of the rock to where nobody sees me, but they see the message that you've given to me. We send your Holy Spirit to impress upon the minds to go back and study for themselves to know if, if this is truth. There is a false righteousness by faith, dear Lord. And many of us have accepted that without even knowing it. Dear Lord, send the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts so we can receive these truths. For we ask in your name. Amen. So we were on... A2, A being God's part and B being our part. And A2 says he will convict you of sin. In John 16, 8, it says he will reprove, and I use convict, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. In Christian service 16, paragraph 2, it says the divine teacher says, my spirit alone is competent to teach and to convict of sin. It is through the influence of the Holy Spirit that we are convicted of sin and feel our need of pardon. First selected message is 353, paragraph 2. In Acts 26, 18, it says, Open, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them who are sanctified by faith. 
that is in me. If studied and obeyed, the Word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. The Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin. But it also says He will convict of righteousness. What does that mean? Do we have the fruit of Christ's righteousness in our lives? Or is it self-righteousness? When we realize that we have the fruits of the flesh in our hearts, we will realize that we are not ready for the judgment and that we are in a lost condition. Do we have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Galatians 5, 22-25 brings out the fruit of the Spirit. And notice it says the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If we have this fruit in our lives, there's no need for a law. Why is that? Because Christ now lives within us. And then verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 19-21 talks about the works of the flesh. The fruits of the flesh. It says idolatry, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, witchcraft, hatred, variance, and emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If we have the fruit of the Spirit, there is no need for you to be under the law. Why? Because we have died. The old man is no more, and Christ now lives in me. Reflecting Christ, 131 paragraph 2 says, Christ promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. But, when we hear a but, there's something else coming, right? Like every other promise, it is given on conditions. There are many who profess to believe and claim the Lord's promises. They talk about Christ and the Holy Spirit, yet they receive no benefit. Why? Because they do not surrender their souls to the guidance and the control of the divine agencies. If we do not submit to the control of the Holy Spirit, Christ is not in us, and we cannot die. In God's Amazing Grace, 194 paragraph 2, it says, Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary, all cultivated tendencies to evil, to impress His own character upon His church. Can you say amen? We hear so often, oh, I have, I've had this all my life. It was born in me. My parents had it. Whatever. This power tells us that we can have victory over this. We can have the divine power to overcome all these hereditary and cultivated tendencies. John 14, 26 says, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. When we realize that if we don't have the fruit of righteousness which the Holy Spirit wants to give us, we will begin to search as though we were searching for the most valuable possession which we lost or misplaced. And after the Holy Spirit convicts us, what is our part? Look at your cheat sheet. And it says, acknowledge your guilt and need of His righteousness. Righteousness. 
Jeremiah 3, 12 through 13. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backslidden Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only, only what? Acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. You know, we have to stop blaming others. When I have a wrong spirit, who's the fault? It is nobody else but me. I am to blame. Why should I go sinning if we see somebody else sinning? They're doing something wrong, and so now we get angry or upset or irritated, and now we're sinning just like they are. Why should I use Satan's power to correct them instead of using God's power? Brothers and sisters, it is our choice. Men professing to be followers of Christ fail to a low, fall to a low level, always mourning over their shortcomings, but never overcoming and bruising Satan under their feet. Guilt and condemnation constantly burden the soul, and the cry of such might as well be. In Romans 7, 24, what did Paul say? He says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall, be de who shall deliver me from this body of death? The question is, why does God want to reveal the guilt in your lives? Because when God reveals the guilt, it should cause us to flee to Jesus Christ. To confess our sins and to repent humbly. When we acknowledge our guilt, we realize that we, are commit, that we have committed the sin and there is no one else to blame. Not my wife, not my husband, not my children, not the circumstances, not even Satan can get the blame for this. It's our blame. We did it. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. If you have given offense to your friend or neighbor, you are to acknowledge your wrong, and it is his duty to freely forgive you. And then you are to seek the forgiveness of God and listen to this statement. You are to seek the forgiveness of God because the brother you have wounded is the property of God. And injuring him, you have sinned against his creator and the redeemer. That's powerful. Those who have not humbled their souls before God in acknowledging their guilt have not yet fulfilled the first condition of acceptance. So on this list right here, we are still right here. He's trying to draw us, and what are we doing? That's right. If you have not experienced the repentance which is not to be repented of, and have not with true humiliation of soul and brokenness of spirit confessed your sins, abhorring your iniquity, we have never truly sought the forgiveness of sin. And if we have never sought, we have never found the peace of God. If you have ever become impatient, irritated, angry, or rude to anyone, do not blame them even if they have done something wrong. Acknowledge your guilt that you did not represent Christ. But what if I'm not ready to admit my guilt. Can I still come to Jesus? Absolutely. Review and Herald, October 9, I mean, I'm sorry, October 3, 8, 1901, paragraph 8, it says, Come to Christ just as you are and contemplate His love until your hard heart is broken. 
A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. We may say that except the sinner repents for his sins, he cannot be forgiven. Well, that's true, but let him not put off coming to Christ until he has wrought, until he has wrought himself up to a certain pitch of excited feeling until he thinks his sorrow is of sufficient dearth to merit forgiveness. Let the sinner come just as he is and contemplate the love that he has been bestowed upon him, all unworthy as he is. And the first thing he knows, wow, he will realize that Christ's love has broken every barrier down. And that he exercises repentance, which is not to be repented of. The sinner must go to Christ in order that he may be enabled to repent. It is a virtue that goes forth from Jesus, which strengthens the purposes of the heart to turn away from sin and to cleave to that which is truth. It is Christ's virtue that makes repentance sincere and genuine. Remember, God is drawing you, so don't resist Him. If you don't resist Him, he can convict you of the sin in your lives. He can convict you of righteousness. And you can acknowledge your sin. And after you have acknowledged your sin, He will give you repentance. So give God a chance and allow Him to work in your life. Amen. 1901. So after we have acknowledged our sins, God will now give us his part, which is repentance. He'll, he will give us repentance from all of our sins, Acts 5.31. And I want to say I haven't mentioned it before, but in all these parts that we're looking at, seven parts for God, seven parts for us, if you accept the first one, and you accept the second one of our part, but you cannot confess and forsake your sins, you can't continue on in this process. Christ starts knocking on the heart, saying, please let me in. Please don't resist my drawing. Second Corinthians seven ten says, "For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death." We might have worldly sorrow, which means we are sorry that we hurt somebody. But godly sorrow means we hurt Christ. When we sin when we realize that our sins hurt Christ, it should make us want to turn away from our sin. In Mark 2.17 it says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. True repentance causes us to turn away from our sins. Steps of Christ, 23, paragraph 2 says, the repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. So if we're not turning away from our sins, have we had true repentance? No, we haven't. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in the heart, there will be no real change in the life. Second Chronicles 7.14 Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sins. So in this text we have four things that we must do for God to forgive us. What are they? What are they? We shall humble ourselves, right? Then we're going to pray. 
Them are going to seek his face. And then what are we going to do? Amen. We're going to turn from our wicked ways, and then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins. So why should we be so concerned about humbling ourselves? About praying for God's guidance and turning away from our wicked ways? In Christ in His sanctuary, page 126, paragraph 1, it says, all who would have their names retained in the book of life afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be deep, faithful searching of heart, the light, frivolous spirit indulged by so many professed Christians must be put away. The work of preparation is an individual work. We are not saved in groups. The purity and devotion of one will not offset the want of these qualities in another. What about the story of the five foolish virgins? What were they doing? It says, Though all nations are to pass in judgment before God, yet He will examine the cases of each individual with as close and searching scrutiny as if there were not another being upon the earth. Everyone must be tested and found without one spot or wrinkle or any such thing. When God brings us to repentance, we do not want to sin anymore. And all we have to do is forsake our sins and surrender to Him. This is our next part. Our part is we confess and forsake our sins and we give Him our hearts. Proverbs 28.13 says, But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 931, Paragraph 1. Christ is able to save to the uttermost all who come to Him in faith. But, if they cling to their sins, they cannot possibly be saved. For Christ's righteousness covers no sin unrepented of. There are many professed Christians whose confessions of sin are similar to that of Achan. They will in a general way acknowledge their unworthiness, but they refuse to confess the sins whose guilt rests upon their conscience and which have brought the frown of God upon His people. Thus, many conceal sins of selfishness, overreaching dishonesty toward God and their neighbors, sins in the family, and many others which is proper to confess in public. So how many sins are we concealing to God? Brothers and sisters, we can't conceal one sin to God. Steps of Christ, 38 paragraph 1. True confession is always of a specific character and acknowledge particular sins. But all confession should be definite and to the point acknowledging the very sins which you are guilty. Christ wants to cleanse our sins. But if we cling to our sins, He cannot do His part. We must give Christ our heart first and let Him work in us before we are trying, before we try to correct our bad habits and our sinful ways. Without Christ drawing us first, we are trying to do it on our own. Testimonies to Ministers, page 92, paragraph 2. Every sin acknowledged before God with a contrite heart, He will remove. Psalms 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, 
O God, Thou will not despise. What does it mean to have a contrite heart? It means remorseful for past sins. And you are completely resolved to avoid future sins. Desires of Ages, 172, paragraph 1. It says, The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion. A form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old. Did you hear that? The Christian's life is not a modification. It's not an improvement of the old, but a transformation of of the nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6.1 Likewise, reckon also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we are dead to sin, and sin, we have given up our rights to the heart sins. What are the heart sins? They're sins that I can't see in you. You can't see in me. Those are heart sins. If we've given up those rights to use Satan's methods to fight our battles, Jesus now has a right to work in us his character. If we have bitterness, resentment, or any of these heart sins, we have given up our rights to use Satan's methods. And Jesus can now work in us. Review and Herald, March 18, 18, 1880, paragraph 19. The position all must come into is to value salvation dearer than earthly gain. To count everything but loss that they may win Christ. The consecration must be entire. God will admit of no reserve, of no divided sacrifice, no idol. All must die to self and to the world. Then let let us each renew our consecration to God daily. So how do we stay dead to earthly life? We stay alive to God by complete, total surrender. Luke 14, 33, it says, Whosoever whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. You know, it seems like a hard statement. But once you give up all of life's problems, All his life's so-called good things. Your life becomes that much more enjoyable and that that much more fulfilling than it ever was before. Think about it. Review and Herald, February 27, 1900, paragraph 7. The Lord cannot purify the soul until the entire being is surrendered to the working of the Holy Spirit. And that is why there are so many lukewarm Christians today. Sons and Daughters of God, page 105, paragraph 4. If the mind dwells upon temporal things constantly, these things become all self-absorbing. And the devil has so many things that take up our time these days. Computer. um, Facebook. Games. All kinds of stuff. Even Even reading good books. They can take up our time as well. 
These things become all-absorbing, affecting the character so that God's glory is lost of and forgotten. The opportunities that are within reach for them to become conversant with heavenly things are overlooked and our spiritual life dies. Brothers and sisters, make God your entire dependence. When you do otherwise, then it is time for a halt to be called in your life. Stop right where you are and change the order of things. In sincerity, in soul hunger, cry after God. Wrestle with the heavenly agencies until you have the victory. Put your whole being into the Lord's hands, soul, body, mind, and spirit. And be resolved to be His loving, consecrated agency, moved by His will, controlled by His mind, infused by His Spirit. Then you will see heavenly things clearly. I know it says put on your whole being into the Lord's hands, but I still like some of the things that I do. I know they're kind of sinful, but they're not really that bad, right? Review and Herald, November 28, 1899, paragraph 5, it says, A partial surrender to truth gives Satan free opportunity to work. Until the soul temple is fully surrendered to God, it is the stronghold of the enemy. Review and Herald, November 28, 1899, paragraph 5. Testimony, volume 6, page 92, paragraph 2. Satan does not want anyone to see the necessity of an entire surrender to God. And as we talked about in the first service, there's a false righteousness by faith. As long as we believe that false righteousness by faith, There's no reason to have a complete surrender to Jesus Christ. When the soul fails to make this surrender, sin is not forsaken. The appetites and passions are striving for the mastery. Temptations confuse the conscience so that true conversion does not take place. Ezekiel 18, 30 and 31 says, Repent, repent, and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. And make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die? If we surrender our whole being to the Holy Spirit, what is God's next part? He will forgive, He will cleanse and regenerate and free you to live a sanctified life. John 1, 9, we just read that earlier. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All. all. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that includes our heart sins. The very sins that only God knows about. And Jesus wants to give you a new heart. So what about the thief on the cross? What was his story and what was his final sentence? Well, he surrendered every single thing and accepted Jesus Christ. And he was saved on the cross. Immediately when he recognized Christ as his Savior. His heart changed, and he became a new person. And he started to witness to the other thief. He was not saved in his sins. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 97, paragraph 1, there are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit. And they hope that in this way to become a Christian... But they are beginning in the wrong place. The first work is in the heart. And this is where the thief on the cross started. What are the works of the heart? Anger, selfishness, 
jealousy, envy, bitterness, lusting, coveting, resentment, rebellion, irritation, impatience, and worldliness. Our first must, our first work must begin in the heart. The heart sins must be removed so we can yield our hearts to God. Steps of Christ, 43, paragraph 2. The whole heart must be yielded to God or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored in His image. 1 John 1, yes. Oh, absolutely. We're going to get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. While Christ was on the cross, a soldier pierced the side of Jesus, and out came two distinct streams. What were they? Blood and water. What was the significance of that? The blood of Jesus Christ that was shed was to wash away our sins and all those who believe in Him. The water represents the living water which only Jesus Christ can give us in a new life to a new believer. And that believer, he will never thirst again and become a fountain of, and become a fountain of life. John 4.14 but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Early Writings, 209, paragraph 2. It brings out that the blood was to wash away the sins, and the living water was to be obtained from Jesus Christ. But this water is different than the water of baptism. This is why Jesus said, unless you are born with the water and the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. When you are baptized, what are you doing? You are publicly acknowledging that you are dead to sin and you are buried in Christ and are coming alive to Him. So if you've been baptized and you thought you died and you came back up having the same sins that you, that you had when you went in the water, you're not really dead, right? And that's why it's so crucial that before you have any kind of a baptism, before someone's ready for baptism, you should understand how to die to self and be born again. And this question needs to be asked to every person to see if they have been taught how to have a new life. Because if you have not been taught how to, how to have a new life, you're going to go back in the same old things all over again. Trying and trying and trying and trying and giving up because you just can't do it. And we cannot do it. Christ that liveth within us can't do it. That's it. Mount of Blessings, 114, paragraph 1. Forgiveness has a broader meaning than many suppose. In Isaiah 55, 7 through 9, it says, God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not a judicial act. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. And David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The forgiveness of our sins is what's involved in justification. We cannot save or regenerate ourselves. Only God can do this. It is a miracle of God's grace that we can't even understand. All we can do is approach the foot of the cross, the uplifted cross, and fall on our knees and there be born anew. Justification is not only declaring us righteous, 
but also cleansing us from all sin and creating in us a new heart, a new attitude. And this happens when we have a total surrender to God. Not only that, we believe that God can do it in us. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verses 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. And this is when, it, this is when reconciliation takes place between God and us. It takes place because Jesus came into the world to reconcile, reconcile us. To reestablish a close relationship with us and make us one with him. But this is the problem with the lukewarm. They still need to have a total surrender to Jesus Christ. They have a legalistic religion and they will never have a complete surrender to Christ. Colossians 1.20 says, and having made peace through the blood, reconcile all things unto himself. And now that we have been reconciled, we are ready to enter into the holy place experience, which is called sanctification. Many people have a misunderstanding of the meaning of justification and sanctification. They believe sanctification is the work of a lifetime of trying and trying and trying to give up our sins while all the time being justified. But that idea is just not true. Justification cleanses us from sin. It creates a new heart and then empowers us to live a sanctified life. A life of daily abiding and growing in Christ. And bearing the fruits of His holiness. Our High Calling, page 212, paragraph 2. It is to give oneself wholly and without reserve, soul, body, and spirit to God, to deal justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, to know and to do the will of God without regard to self or self-interest. To be heavenly-minded, pure, unselfish, holy, and without spot or stain. So what happens when one sins? He must go back to the altar of the outer courts and be cleansed from his sins. He must be forgiven all over again. For Selected Messages, 317 paragraph 2, it says the work of sanctification is the work of a lifetime. It must go on continually. But this work cannot go on in the heart while the light on any part of the truth is rejected or neglected. The sanctified soul will not be content to remain in ignorance, but will desire to walk in the light and to seek for greater light. God will never hide sin in you. Christ will never put His robe of righteousness on you as a sinner to hide you from sin. That's the chart of the false righteousness by faith. As you can see, conversion begins, you have faith, and you start the process. And you go up, and then you fall, right? You go up, and then you fall. 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 And at some point in time, you become perfect. And then you go to heaven. All right? It says, imputed righteousness is like a covering umbrella making us always complete in Christ. Is that true? That's not true. Sanctification gradually overcoming sin and becoming more like Christ. That's not how it works. And that's what has gotten so many people confused. And so many people just give up because of this. 
Remember, you can't serve two masters. When Satan is on the throne of your heart, who's on, who's on the throne? Christ can't be on your throne. Satan is. Desires of Ages, page 555, paragraph 6. The righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It is a principle of life that transforms the character and controls the conduct. Holiness is wholeness for God. It is the entire surrender of heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of heaven. What is holiness? Holiness is not rapture. It is, it is an entire surrender of the will of God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness, as well as in the light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestioning confidence and resting in His love. That's Acts of the Apostles, 51, paragraph 2. Keeping ourselves wholly surrendered to God and walking in His will, this is the work of a lifetime. You catch that? Keeping ourselves wholly surrendered to God and walking in His will, that is the work of a lifetime. Doing this never stops. Hebrews 12, 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How many shall see the Lord? Without holiness? No man. No man. Faith and Works, 87, paragraph 1. True sanctification is nothing more or less than to love God with all the heart, to walk in His commandments and ordinances blameless, Sanctification is not an emotion, but a heaven-born principle that brings all the passions and desires under the control of the Spirit of God. And this work is done through our Lord and Savior. We can't do it. Only God can do it if we stay surrendered to Him. As I have come to the foot of the cross and acknowledge my guilt, He has given me repentance. I have confessed and forsaken my sins as well as given Him my heart. He has forgiven. He has cleansed and regenerated me. He's freed me to live a sanctified life. So what is our next part? Our next part is to believe that He can do it and accept it. It is hard to believe that He can forgive us of our sins. And to regenerate us. It's so, so hard to believe that. But he can. He wants to do it. But it's our choice. John 3, 14 and 15 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what if I don't believe that Jesus can do it? Will He do it? He won't do it. If we don't believe that He can do it, He can't do it. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. He cannot do it for me because we must have faith. Romans 10.17 So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We must spend time with God on our knees, as well as in the Scriptures and the spirit of prophecy, in order to have the faith to believe that what He promises He will do in our lives. You have confessed your sins and in, the, and in your heart put them away. You have resolved to give yourself to God. Now go to Him. And ask that He will wash away your sins and give you a new heart. Then believe that He does this because He promised it. Remember the story about the children of Israel, how they complained and complained to Moses and God? 
how he took them out of Egypt, brought them in the desert, didn't give them any water, no food. Well, he gave them some food, finally. He gave them some manna, right? And they complained and complained and complained. And what happened? God removed his protected covering against the children of Israel, and all of a sudden there were serpents everywhere. They were there the whole time, but he was protecting them. He removed his protected covering, and they started getting bitten like crazy. They started dying by, cra- by the numbers. The people came to God and did what? They came to Moses. They said, God, we're sorry for our sins. Moses, we're sorry for our sins. Forgive us. Do something. Like a loving God that we have, he told Moses to what? To build a serpent and put it on a pole and tell the people to look at the serpent and live. Many looked at that serpent and they lived. Many did not look at the serpent and they died. It's our choice. Patriarchs and Prophets, 431, paragraph 1. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so was the Son of Man lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. All who have ever lived upon the earth have felt the deadly sting of that old serpent called the devil. And Satan, Revelation 12, 9. The fatal effects of sin can be removed only by the provision that God has made. The Israelites saved their lives by looking upon the uplifted serpent. But that look implied faith. They had to have faith in what God told them. They lived because they believed God's word and trusted in the means provided for their recovery. So the sinner may look to Christ and live. John 21, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He wants us to love Him and obey Him, but out of love, not force. That's why He stands at the door of your heart and He knocks, waiting to come in. Jesus loves to have us come to Him just as we are, sinful, helpless, dependent. We may come with all our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and fall at His feet in penitence. It is His glory that encircles us in the arms of His love to bind up our wounds, to cleanse us from all impurity. Here is where thousands fall. They do not believe that Jesus pardons them personally and individually. They do not take God at His word. It is a privilege of all who comply with the conditions to know for themselves that pardon is freely extended to all. Put away the suspicion that God's promises are not meant for you. They are for every repentant transgressor. Strength and grace have been provided through Christ to be brought by ministering angels to every believing soul. None are so sinful that they cannot find strength. There is not anybody in this room or anybody that you know that is so sinful that they cannot come to the foot of the cross. None are so sinful that they cannot find strength and purity and righteousness in Jesus who died for them. He is waiting to strip them of their garments stained and polluted with sin and to put upon them the white robes of righteousness. He bids them live. Look at me. Don't die. So why is it so hard for many to believe that Jesus can cleanse you from your sins and give you a new heart? Well, many believe it takes a lifetime to give up their sins, and that's just a plain lie. Today you can come to Him. Today you can be cleansed from your sins. Today you can be in a right relationship with God. But you only have today. You are never promised tomorrow. You're only promised today. So don't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow never comes. When tomorrow comes, it's today. Remember the thief on the cross? He believed and God saved him. If you and Harold 
August 1, 1893, paragraph 2. Through all ages in every nation, those that believe that Jesus can, can and will save them personally from sin are the elect and chosen of God. They are his peculiar treasure. They obey his call and come out of the world and separate themselves from every unclean thought and unholy practice. It's a sad fact that the great proportion of God's professed people have not had faith in Christ as their personal Savior. What did we learn earlier? Not one in a hundred understand righteousness by faith. Hebrews 11.6 Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently, what? Seek Him. Seek him. Amen. John 20.27 20, be not faithless, but believing. Mark 9, 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Remember Christ's first miracle? The water turning to wine? Remember the leper that was made cleansed? That was cleansed? Signs of the Times. August 10, 1891, paragraph 2. That same power that turned the water to wine at the marriage feast of Cana is able to eradicate all evil from our nature and to make us partakers of the divine nature. The very same power that made the leper clean can make the heart pure, fit for the society of God, of angels, and for the redeemed host. Brothers and sisters, this is what the thief on the cross believed. The question is, do you believe it? The very same power is available to you and for me. It is not us doing it. It's God's doing it in us. Romans 1.16 For I am, not, I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth. Matthew 9.26 According to your faith, be it unto you. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1074, paragraph 1. Faith is simple in its operation and powerful in its results. Wow. Faith is simple in its operation. Many profess Christians who have a knowledge of the sacred word and believe its truth. But they fail in the Christ-like trust that is essential to the religion of Jesus. They do not reach out with that peculiar touch that brings the virtue healing of the soul. Remember the lady that reached out and she touched Christ's garment? That's the faith that we have to have. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe His Word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ and serve Him. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. Stars of Ages 203, paragraph 2. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart... It transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. No one sees the hand that lifts the burden or beholds the light descend from the courts above. The blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see can create a new being in the image of God. This is what happens when we have the new birth experience. This is what the thief on the cross experienced when he 
was surrendered in faith. As he spoke the words of promise, the dark cloud that seemed to enshroud the cross was pierced by a bright and living light. To the penitent thief came the perfect peace of accepting God. And he was acknowledged as a sin bearer. The thief realized Christ was his. Amen. Men may exercise power over his human body. They may pierce the holy temples with the crown of thorns. They may strip him in his raiment and quarrel over its division, but they cannot rob him of the power to forgive sins. In dying, he bears testimony to his own divinity and to the glory of the Father. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. Neither his arm shortened that it cannot save. It is his royal right to save unto the uttermost who come to God by Him. As the thief hung on the cross, there was one gleam of comfort through Jesus. The Jews didn't believe. The disciples doubted His divinity. And didn't Mary doubt Him as well? The thief on the cross... He had been convinced and convicted that Christ could save him, and he really believed it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17-18 If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. God, who, th- who hath re- reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, God wants to reestablish a close relationship with us. But it's our choice. Review and Herald, April 24, 1900, paragraph 6. It says, We must learn of Christ. We must know what He is to those He has ransomed. We must realize that through belief in Him, it is our privilege to be partakers of the divine nature and so escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Then we are cleansed from sin. All defects of character, we need not retain one sinful propensity. Christ is the sin bearer. And John pointed out when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Do you believe it? Do you really, really believe it? We must believe because the next part which God does in our lives is He will live in you and empower you. But if you don't believe, He can't live in you. And we are the same lost people in the same condition. It's your choice. As I ask for Billy Mashburn to come up front, he's going to sing a song for us. I want you to contemplate what we've talked about. Contemplate if we truly have surrendered to Jesus Christ. Have we been drawn to Him? Have we resisted His drawing? Without those two first parts, we're nothing. We're sinners in need of a Savior.
Amen. So the question is, what is your choice? He only wants us one day at a time. Moment by moment. But one day at a time. What is your choice? Is your choice to be like the rich young ruler that said, you know what? It's too much for me. I can't do it. Or is it Nicodemus? He said, Lord, I'm a sinful man. I need you. What is your choice? As I get ready to pray, all those that we admit by raising your hands that we do need a, a Savior. We need to make these choices. We, we need to come to the cross. Let Him see our sinful ways. We need to see what, it, what He did. He took our sins. We don't understand that. He took our sins as if, as if they were His very own sins. He felt our sins as if He committed those sins Himself. How many want to raise your hands and say, Lord, help me one day at a time? Should we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, as you've seen the hands that were were raised, we need your help. Moment by moment, day by day, Help us to recognize, dear Lord, that You want to save us. You want us to be in Your kingdom, but we have to accept You. It's our choice. Help us to make the right choice, dear Lord. Please forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, for we ask in Your name.